Hello, everybody, and very welcome to the fourth episode of our uh, new webinar series, The Green New Deal, the world, we, the world Needs Now. So today we are um, going to speak about energy. So we are entering the, the heart of this, uh, of this series with a, with a topic that is at the, at the core of, uh, of what a Green New Deal is about. And um, just, just a few words of, of introductions. Uh, this, um, this, the, the Green New Deal series is a series co-hosted by the Rosa Luxembourg Foundation together with, uh, with the Transform Network. And we are very pleased to, to receive you to, today. Uh, last week, we had a, a great chapter on, the, on trade deals and climate change. And, and today, we're going we're gonna to enter into the, the question of energy. So the, the core of the Green New Deal project is about to restructure our energy system in a way that our economies and societies will be supplied by clean and sustainable energy sources. But um, the need to decarbonize our economies uh, and to, to reduce the, to the impact of, a, of the disastrous impact of, of, climate cri of the climate crisis is the first drive of, of the project and the concept of the Green New Deal. But the force of, the, of this concept is that it goes way beyond this, and it, do, it does not stop with the, the development of renewable energy. It, uh, offer, it offers to operate a transformation of the economy, with also massive public investment into renewables and clean energy. And on the other side, um, it's, it is also a tool to gain citizen control and citizen and worker control over the energy system. So the concept of the Green New Deal is not only to decarbonize, but it's also to democratize and to generalize access to, to energy, the energy that is seen um, as a right and a, and a public good. And another uh, central aspect of, of what a Green New Deal or maybe a radical Green New Deal is, um, uh, is the global aspect of, of it. Um, if climate change is a global historical projects uh, and, uh, and has uh, global intersections, uh, its response has to follow the, the, the same path. And uh, does that mean that we have to stop uh, local or national uh, initiatives, uh, but they have to be grounded into a wider, a wider perspective um, and to make sure that those programs that appear uh, in the global north, uh, firstly, or the, the, the term Green New Deal was firstly, um, this firstly appearing in the, in, in, in the global north, and to, so to make sure that it does not replicate the, the history of wealth extraction and uh, human and natural dis dis destruction to the global south. So those could be the, are going to be the, the core uh, drivers of our today uh, discussions. And without uh, more uh, uh, waiting, I will uh, introduce our today, today's panelists. Um, first, let me greet uh, Lavinia Steinfurt. Hi, Lavinia. You are a social geographer and uh, an activist working for the Transnational Institute. And um, you've been specifically working and researching on the the question of uh, energy transition and uh, public alternatives to, to privatization. And you're based in, in Amsterdam. The second panelist I would like to uh, actually introduce uh, are based a bit further than, uh, than you, Lavinia, for me. Uh, as I am based in Brussels, I, I forgot to, to mention it is uh, Natalia Carao. Natalia, uh, very welcome to, to, to receive you today. Um, you're based in Montevideo in, in, in Uruguay, and you're working for the Confederation of um, the, you're working for the Trade Union uh, of the Americas Confederation. And you're also part of the Trade Union for Energy Democracy groups. Finally, I, all, I want to present and introduce Lida Forero. 
Lida Ferrero, you're based in Colombia and you're Colombian. You're an economist and uh, you've been uh, for quite a time uh, a colleague of Lavinia working for the Transnational Institute, researching uh, also on corporate captures and, and, and alternatives to, 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 to privatization. And you're now, uh, you're now working as well for, um, for the, the Trade Union of the Americas together with, with Natalia. So very well, very welcome everyone. And I will start with um, we were questioned to to, to go oh, sorry just to interrupt Nassim to interrupt you quickly. We're having just a little problem with interpretation assignment. And so perhaps if we can just pause for one moment both to explain interpretation uh, uh, functionality to our audience and also uh, to, to take a moment to look at assignment. Um, I don't know if one of our friends from Babia Colectivo would like to uh, step in to speak for one moment. Hello, can, can, you, hear can you hear me? Yes. Hi, yeah, there, this, the issue is that the, um, the interpretation isn't assigned for either Luis or me, so we can't broadcast into the Spanish language. So I think, I don't know why the, what the issue is on the other end or if it's, it's not on this Side. It's a matter of assigning the interpreters because I know the French interpreters are assigned, so I can hear the French interpretation. But the Spanish interpretation, I can't select a channel to broadcast into, so that's the issue because I can't hear Luis either on my monitor. I I understand. So uh, right now it should be. Is it is it better? No, it's just that I'm not getting the option to jump into the Spanish channel, so I'm not an interpreter at all on the call. And I don't see Luis either, that's why I can't hear the, I don't know if anyone can hear the interpretation in Spanish, but I wasn't able to hear it on my end. Okay, I'm just going to try to quickly fix that. I think... Uno, dos, uno, dos, un, dos, tres. ¿Alguien me oye? ¿Se escucha? ¿Se escucha? ¿Probando? ¿Sí, Lida? Is it, is that Perfecto. Okay? Ahora me oyen. Yes, I can hear, I can hear Luis now. Yeah. Okay. Yes, I can hear me. You can hear me. Okay, so we can hear everyone. Okay, so, well, we are implementing a new setups with a double bueno, mientras implementamos nuestras nuevas tecnologías aquí. But, uh, sorry, but I hear you now, uh, Luis, I think, when you're speaking, so. Oh. Do you well, hear me? Audience. At, um, there's a setup where you can hear me at 20% in the uh, other room. You can mute original audio and just be on the English channel if you want to listen in English. Uh, did you get that? If you go to interpretation options, mm -hmm. there is the option of one of three languages that you can be in, and then Zoom gives you an option of muting original audio below that, which either means that you can hear the source language at 20%, or you can only hear the channel that you're listening to. Did you get that? Well, I'm not really sure to, that I see that. It's right underneath um, where you have your language options and in that drop down or drop up window that pops on the language interpretation options, you will see mute original audio too, which then would just leave you with English or French or Spanish only, whichever channel you're, you've clicked on. Okay, and then? I just lost interpretation, so that wasn't it. <laughs> Sorry that we're having those complications. Okay, are, are we good now? All right. Estoy conectado en español. ¿Se me escucha en inglés todavía? 
you still hear me in English? Yes. This is not true. Luis, Luis, do you have the toggle for the rooms on your end? Because I don't have it on my end. That's the issue. Um, next to our names, there should be a Spanish little circle. And we don't have that. Like the French interpreters have it. So therefore, we can't join into the into the room to interpret into. So whenever you speak, you're going to be heard on the on the regular room. No, I don't know. I don't see the toggle. Right. So as when you were, so the problem is that the, so right now the French interpretation is working because as you can see next to their name on the attendee on the panelist list, nice. there's a circle with the U.S. and the French flag, right? So we need to have that same circle as assigned interpreter. So we have the option to split into the separate language rooms and provide the interpretation, but we don't have that. We're we're on our end. We have only the option to hear interpretation, not to give it. So that's the problem that I think Ethan was having, that they weren't able to assign us as interpreters. Nassim, I would suggest that we try to begin with our first uh, non-Spanish speaker, and we ask our Spanish-speaking audience to bear with us for two minutes. And then while that first response is being given, you go into the Zoom back end and reestablish uh, their interpreters' uh, uh, functionality on Zoom.com. So uh, as Jeff over at TNI uh, helpfully suggests to us, the host has to first click on interpretation, then you can add new, and then re-add them as interpreters. He's suggesting you can do it live, but in any case, I, I, would, I would say that in just one or two minutes, we go ahead and, and pivot to our first speaker who's not a Spanish language speaker and, and ask the rest of our audience to bear with us for those two minutes. Well, well, yeah, that's what we're going to do. And again, sorry about those uh, troubles. We are kind of trying to adapt to this, uh, to this situation. Uh, I would like to uh, actually introduce our fourth panelist that has just arrived, uh, Professor Youssef Ben Abdallah. Uh, thank you very much for, for joining us today. Um, professor Younes Benadala, you're a professor at the Ecole Nationale Supérieure des Statistiques et d'Economie Appliquée in Algiers. And I would actually like to, to start um, with a question for you, uh, Professor Benadala. So um, I, as I was explaining, in the North and uh, more precisely in Occidental Europe, the concept of energy transition, uh, switching from fossil fuels to renewables, has been popularized, um, especially through a rising climate movement that has been increasingly pushing uh, governments to adopt uh, measures and to react to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions and to push for a decarbonized economy. So my, my question to you, to, to you, Professor, is what does it mean for a country like Algeria who, um, who possess 3% of the world gas reserves and 1% of the oil reserves, and for which the hydrocarbon sector represents often 50% uh, of the entire GDP of the country. Uh, but without uh, often uh, providing democratic access to the, to, to, to the resource, but what does, how does what does the echo of an energy transition? What what does it? What does the energy transition really means uh, for uh, for in Algeria? And is there like a civil uh, movement that carries those uh, those claims? I will I will um, I met you right now. You, you need to unmute yourself, uh, uh, Professor. Profit. Can someone hear the Professor? Oh, ah. Can you speak right now? I have unmuted him, but he is having a problem with his <laughs> with his sound. Uh, 
I think you need to speak to him and, and let him Professor know that. Yus Professor Youssef, we don't we we don't hear you, so you need to either turn on the, 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 the sound of your of your computer or to speak maybe. Je crois qu'il faut lui parler en français. Oui, Monsieur, Monsieur Youssef, je crois qu'il faut qu'il faut que vous que vous euh, remontiez le, le son de votre de votre ordinateur. On vous entend. On ne peut pas vous entendre ici. Non, on ne vous entend pas, malheureusement. Je ne pense que. Est-ce que vous êtes. Est-ce que vous pourriez. Connecté, vous êtes connecté avec votre ordinateur, j'imagine. Ok, je, on va essayer de. Je pense que votre peut-être que votre micro n'est pas connecté, monsieur, monsieur. Non, on ne vous entend pas. On ne vous entend pas, malheureusement. Je vais donc... Uh, I will try to switch to, to English again. Um, we're really sorry about those, uh, those, those technical problems. It seems that like we will have a, quite a complicated session uh, today. It's a bit beyond our our wheel of course and control. I, I've seen people saying this is the, the, bit, the start of the collapse. I hope not. <laughs> we will stay in. So I might want to turn to our English speaker tonight. I have the, the interpretation. Oh. Can I? Can everyone hear me? Okay. Well, we, I will try to turn now to, to Lavinia and, and, and really tr uh, hopefully we will fix those, uh, those issues uh, during the, 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 the run of this, of this webinar. Uh, it's, it's a shame we have uh, really a great panel tonight and, and we really would like to to hear all those those voices and and um, and but now I, I, I will try to to turn to Lavinia and um, I'm I will ask you uh, Lavinia um, so we we were supposed to have uh, to to hear the the different realities of of energy transition and and the concept of of uh, of of climate justice in in different uh, in different contexts, um, but I would like to to come back to the to Europe now and to see we've been hearing a lot about uh, um, the, the, the 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 energy transition, especially with with one specific actor, the European Commission, um, that has been claiming to be championing the push for a, for a transition. Uh, within different plans and reforms, we, we, I'm thinking about the, the clean energy package and, and orders. Um, and before the, the, the start of the, of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, we were hearing a lot about the, the Green Deal proposal, that is the, the new plan proposed by the, by the Commission. And today we are talking about the Green New Deal. However, when we look back and when we look at uh, the, the, the numbers of both the green gas house emi emissions in Europe, as well as the developments of, of renewables, um, we see first that we're not uh, at all aligned with the, the, the target set up by the, the, the Paris Agreement, uh, and also that the, li the, the liberal approach uh, promoted by the, the European Commission um, has not uh, 
has failed to 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 really instill a, a, a powerful and a democratic transition in Europe. Um, so I, I would have liked to you to, to to talk me about the response, uh, especially from from movements and uh, uh, people organizing around the the, the the need to to promote uh, the energy democracy, the control of uh, of energy, and take back. Um, take back energy between uh, citizen hands. Um, so uh, if you please could elaborate a bit on, on, on that point. Uh, yes, hi, thanks Nassim and all the organizers. Am I clear? Are people hearing me? Yeah, great, okay. Um, so let me briefly take my notes also. Um, yeah, I, I would be very happy to explain uh, why energy democracy is crucial for achieving a socially just transition and then how communities, trade unions and public authorities can join forces to build it. Um, because if we don't deepen the democratic ownership and organization of our energy systems that keep our lights on, our houses comfortable, our food and medicines cool and many of us connected, then these dirty exploitative activities will prevail. So whether it's in the form of multinationals or corporate, corporatized state-owned utilities. Um, so the Green New Deal for Europe was kind of formed to turn demands uh, for climate justice into policy proposals. But as you said, indeed, the following European New Deal launched by the European European Commission continues to focus on economic growth, um, but communities across the world experience of that um, economic growth in favor of big business is blocking the transition um, because over the last years, the transition has been left to the private sector. Um, and this has resulted in uh, surging energy bills, massive job cuts, lack of uh, investments and higher costs for local authorities. So we've seen a massive drop in renewable energy investments over the past years, also uh, in Europe, in China and in the United States. And um, research by uh, trade unions for energy democracy in particular has, shows, has shown us um, how the initial growth in solar and wind um, convinced many governments to uh, that the transition no longer needed subsidies and they decided to revoke feed-in tariffs. Um, but without state support and with lower prices for renewables, uh, markets don't deliver the high returns that private investors are hoping for, are looking for, right? So um, to, to show how residents and communities and, and municipalities are changing this paradigm, um, we've uh, investigated with partners that over the past years, uh, more than 1,400 Remunicipalizations have happened across the world, and the majority of them happened in the energy sector. So, um, for example, the grassroots Energiewende in Germany has pressured many local authorities to reclaim gas and electricity grids, but also to create um, public supply companies. Um, but then, next to reclaiming our energy systems on the local level, which also of course, needs to happen on the country level, on the regional, on the international level. We also see that municipalist platforms and um, value-driven public policy can lead to more democratic energy policies. So very briefly, some small examples. Um, the city of Plymouth in the UK um, has supported its residents to create a um, Plymouth energy community. And this has supported over 20,000 households to save um, more than one million pounds on their energy bill in total. And they also created a solar farm that provides a source of income for the marginalized surrounding community. Um, or like in Cadiz, the south of Spain, the municipalist government has created uh, round tables, um, one to tackle energy poverty and another for an energy transition, um, which means that it has been structurally engaging its citizens to democratize its energy systems from the ground up. Um, and as a result, residents have co-designed an alternative energy discount model that is now being piloted by the city. So to kind of co-govern and co-create policy uh, with residents is I think a very important lesson here. Or, uh, or take Burgas, this Bulgarian city has actually retrofitted half of its residential buildings. Uh, and this was um, 
completely paid for so that low income residents uh, could participate. Um, and it not only led then to, to substantially less emissions, but also made the homes of people much more affordable and livable. Um, and then I think it's a very important figure uh, uh, launched or promoted by energy cities that when an energy project is entirely locally financed and controlled, this creates eight to 10 times more value than when it's in the hands of an external operator. Um, so, Un projet communautaire, ça, ça génère huit à dix fois plus de valeur qu'un projet euh, créé par une entreprise. Oh, sorry, I, I hear French now. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I think we, we're just having a little, uh, again, a little problem. Can, can you speak now, Lavinia? Yeah, do you hear me now? Yeah, we do. Okay, okay, cool. Um, yeah, so maybe just to have um, two more minutes, if that's okay. Of course. Yeah, okay. Um, so... It's kind of to show that uh, democratization of our energy systems is already happening locally um, and that we need to uh, skill, the, skill this up and make sure we, we cover entire territories, right, and work together on an international level. But as long as privatizations continue to set the scene, then an energy transition is very unlikely to succeed. So as Nassim said, um, the European Commission pays lip service to community energy, but actually because of all this competition that benefits the big fish, um, this actually leads to bigger market monopolies, right? So in the last years, we've seen um, energy cooperatives, small scale ones going bankrupt in Germany and Denmark, and this will happen elsewhere too when we continue to focus on competition. Um, so to counter this, um, what if we as countries and cities and energy communities would stop competing each other, but work together to activate, uh, to advocate for democratic public ownership and finance and cooperation on all levels, right? So the national, uh, the regional, the international, but also the local that I was speaking a bit more to. Um, so by working together, uh, we as social labor and environmental justice movements can really organize the wider population in order to call for those Green New Deals that replace public-private partnerships with pro-public, pro, uh, po people-powered and system-wide coordination. Um, because, yes, only this can ensure that the most oppressed groups in society, from poor families, indigenous communities, people of color, to women, trans and non-binary persons can, can really drive and co-determine um, the regenerative and redistributive energy models of the future. So um, uh, the Just Transition Workshop report that came out uh, some time ago uh, in English um, is the outcome of such a collaboration. And I'm sure Natalia and Lida will speak more to this um, because during this workshop uh, that happened in October last year, environmental justice groups and trade unions like Tuca um, shared how they have been jointly organizing towards a just transition and how we can build on these alliances. So um, to, to slowly close um, what, I, what I prepared for, um, for a just transition, we also seriously need to practice energy conservation. This fundamentally means reducing and changing how we use energy by treating it as a common need, a human right and public service. So calling for energy democracy can also help us to rapidly degrow or divest from fossil fuel industries like mining, agriculture, construction and transportation, but simultaneously rapidly revaluing and investing in care work, sovereign food systems and the many public services on which our collective health depends, right? So maybe just a, a final note on finance. It's clear that private finance is so much more expensive than public funds because of excessive profits, sky high consultancy fees, also expensive outsourcing and the interest rate that tends to be double for the private sector. Um, 
So what if we no longer leave the transition to the market, but start investing these public funds directly into um, a just transition? And globally, these amount to over 73 trillion US dollars. Um, but of course, these also need to be uh, desperately democratized. Um, so for Green New Deal, to be fair, on a global level, we clearly need to call also for global tax justice, international debt cancellation, a UN binding treaty for multinationals uh, to hold them accountable accountable and bringing down trade deals such as the Energy Charter Treaty. Um, and all this is, of course, crucial to also force neo-colonial governments in the Netherlands, where I live, to start paying their fair share of the climate crisis, uh, because it's key that unconditional climate finance will be channeled to frontline countries and communities so that the so-called global south, um, in the so-called global south, so that people from, from Chile to Nigeria can really start to build their own energy democracies on their own terms, right? Um, in other words, um, a global Green New Deal um, won't happen with decarbonization only, uh, but the future can be renewable when our systems are deprivatized, democratized, and decolonialized. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Lavinia. Thank you so much for this very comprehensive uh, uh, explanation and, and uh, and mapping as well, uh, and I think we will hopefully we will have time to to go back to certain points that you have uh, that you have raised. Uh, that, was, that was that was really great. Um, I just would like to let everyone know that it looks like that we are uh, fine right now. That the translation is working uh, from uh, from English to to Spanish and should be working from the Spanish to to English. So we will. I thank uh, a lot all the all my co-workers that have been a great help in this. Um, and we will, yeah, it's the, it happens and it's the, the risk of, the, of, of the, the, the live sessions that we are trying to, to, to broadcast and bring to you. But now I'm, I'm very happy to, to pass on to, to, to Natalia and Lisa and to, to try to, to have another view from Latin America and from the, the, the trade unions perspective as well. Uh, so you've both working for a regional trade union organization uh, in Latin America where transnational oil and gas companies are really present exploiting resources and workforce. And the region counts, counts with many economies and uh, nations largely depending on extractivism. Um, I'm thinking of country like, like, like Chile or, or Ecuador, but Mexico also. And we have the cases, cases of, of Colombia and Brazil that, uh, as well. Um, and it's, always, it's often a, a place portrayed. Uh, um, it's like we often hear stories about communities that are suffering the high prices of, uh, of extraction, uh, being the destruction of their, of their land or or the displacements of their of, of the communities and the the, the murders of, of of activists who who stand up against those crimes and I'm thinking about like as Colombia as a, as a as an example example of that. So my question would be, uh, what does it mean to to fight for for climate justice in in this context in the context of Latin America and how this related also to the to the concept of energy democracy that Lavinia has just very greatly explained. And so for everyone that will listen to us and that want to hear the translation, need to go into the English room right now. Bueno, eh, hola, eh, buenos días, buenas tardes a todos y a todas. Eh, nosotros vamos a hacer una, una intervención en una primera parte mía, luego pasamos salida y, y volvemos eh, conmigo. Para quienes no conocen la Confederación Sindical de Trabajadores y Trabajadoras de las Américas, es la expresión continental de la Confederación Sindical Internacional y representa alrededor de 55 millones de trabajadores en todo el continente. Para el sindicalismo de las Américas, esta reflexión sobre transición energética tiene que analizarse o la analizamos en una perspectiva crítica y un poco más amplia que, que específicamente la cuestión de los sistemas energéticos y de, y de, y de qué desafíos presentan para eh, la justicia climática o para la justicia ambiental. 
Eh, la Confederación Sindical de las Américas eh, elaboró desde el 2014 una plataforma de desarrollo de las Américas eh, que intenta superar esa mirada minimalista sobre el desarrollo que coloca el, el énfasis en el crecimiento económico. Desde la Plada, eh, que es una construcción innovadora para el sindicalismo, incluso porque se elaboró en diálogo con otras organizaciones y movimientos sociales en la región, eh, al, al, algunas cuestiones eh, centrales que se levantan allí tienen que ver con la justicia ambiental, con la seguridad y la soberanía alimentaria, con la justicia fiscal, con la democracia, los derechos humanos, los derechos laborales en particular, entre otros. Eh, digamos que la plaga es la, el programa político del sindicalismo de las Américas, y la visión de desarrollo que tienen los sindicatos en la región responde un poco a esa perspectiva, que es bastante más amplia. Quiero decir que algunas discusiones que son muy protagónicas en Europa, en Estados Unidos o en países eh, del norte global, eh, en América Latina no son eh, ni, ni, ni tan urgentes en la agenda política ni tan protagónicas, eh, simplemente por el, por el sencillo y muy importante hecho de que acá se están llevando adelante luchas y disputas que tienen que ver con la vida y con los derechos no solo los derechos laborales, también los derechos humanos. Lo mencionaba Nesim recién, de la, eh, la pelea por la vida de dirigentes, eh, de líderes y lideresas en la región, cuando eh, eh, practican un activismo por la justicia ambiental, pero también por la justicia social, por los derechos humanos, por los derechos laborales. Además de eso, nuestra región tiene en promedio un poco más de la mitad de su población eh, eh, trabajando en condiciones de informalidad. Esto quiere decir que no tienen protección social. El Estado ha fallado a estos trabajadores y trabajadoras en protegerlos en sus derechos, en garantizar que puedan tener un trabajo decente y que puedan ejercer sus derechos y llevar a sus hogares un eh, salario digno que puedan sobrevivir. Y no es menor ese hecho, porque no es esa la realidad que ocurre en, en Europa y no es esa la realidad que ocurre en la mayor parte de los países desarrollados. Y es eh, un parteaguas para discutir cuestiones sobre justicia ambiental y cuestiones sobre cómo vamos a atender la emergencia climática, que sí la reconocemos. Entonces, para nosotros las discusiones sobre energía, ambiente y trabajo, además de eh, la construcción conjunta que hemos hecho con la Confederación Sindical Internacional, ha sido trascendental los aportes de aliados eh, políticos estratégicos como el TNI, pero también en la región el TUED, el Trade Unions for Energy Democracy, eh, del que somos parte, interactuamos y que nutre nuestra perspectiva respecto a eh, cuestiones centrales de la justicia ambiental y la discusión sobre la crisis eh, climática, como por ejemplo la propiedad pública de la energía. Además, importante mencionar que nosotros venimos trabajando en una articulación en un grupo de trabajo específico sobre medio ambiente y trabajo, que has, que, que, en el que estas reflexiones se dan, eh, participamos de las eh, negociaciones del clima, intentando una articulación con organizaciones y movimientos sociales, decimos siempre que nuestro poder dentro de las negociaciones de las COP eh, será fuerte si podemos movilizarnos también fuera, entonces trabajamos en esa movilización fuera de las COP con organizaciones y movimientos sociales y dentro de las COP disputando la visión hegemónica de atención a la eh, crisis climática. Y, eh, y también en un, uno de los, de los puntos importantes en el trabajo de la CSA respecto a estos temas fue eh, la tercera conferencia sobre energía, eh, ambiente y trabajo en fines del 2018, en el que a, a, en el que continuamos ese trabajo en el grupo de trabajo con organizaciones y movimientos, solo que tuvimos una discusión en el que profundizamos algunas cuestiones sobre transición energética, sobre democratización de la energía, intentando eh, hacer zoom, eh, ampliando un poco la mirada, pero también focalizando en algunas eh, cuestiones eh, que operan como desafíos, pero también como amenazas para discutir específicamente la democratización energética y específicamente la transición energética en nuestra región, que sabemos que es distinto. Le voy a dar la palabra a Lida. Sí, gracias Natalia, Nesim. Eh, ¿Se escucha? Escucho otra. 
No, está bien. Eh, bueno. I, I, I'm going to pause you for one moment, uh, Lida. Tenemos un pequeño problema que pensamos que esta vez eh, es un problema de Zoom eh, para nosotros. No sé si es posible para usted eh, hablar inglés. Eh, sé que habías pre preparado en, eh, en español. Si no es posible, no es posible y si no es un problema. Pero eh, no está funcionando muy bien en este momento el, el, la interpretación. Eh, eh, escuchamos eh, usted eh, en inglés y eh, en español todo al mismo tiempo, es todo mezclado y un poco difícil para nuestro público. Eh, eh, sorry, we're having a little bit of a problem. Our, our uh, folks uh, are aware of this who are listening in the public that we are hearing Spanish and English simultaneously on the interpretation channel. I have talked with our interpreters. They believe that this is a uh, problem of, of, of Zoom. What should happen normally is that you click on a language and then you mute original audio. And the mute original audio button is not working for most of our public right now. Um, so, um, bueno, usted me diga, Lida, si no es posible para usted o si es es demasiado difícil. Eh, eh, entendemos si es posible de entender y de com comprender, pero, eh, pero es, es difícil eh, para escuchar bien. Eh, es la situación en la que nos encontramos. Eh, perdón, amor. So I prepared it in Spanish. It might be a bit challenging. I, I can try, I can do my best. The only question will be if uh, the Spanish speakers, the people who only understand Spanish will will have uh, interpretation. Uh, sí. Yeah, otherwise Totalmente. they are excluded. Eso anda bien, es, es solamente de eh, español al inglés que estamos teniendo este problema. No es con fr francés, no es con inglés al español. Entonces, si puede, eh, para los que están ahí que hablan solamente español, ustedes van a poder eh, escuchar la presentación en español en eh, la cadena de interpretación para todos que estén, eh, todas y todos que estén ahí. Eh, perdón, eh, gracias Lida por eh, <laughs> acompañarnos en este momento, un poco complicado. Yeah, okay, I, I'll, I'll try. As I said, the, I prepared it in Spanish, so it might be a bit of Spanglish maybe when, when I'm speaking, because I will like take my notes from Spanish, but uh, let's try. Um, so Natalia was mentioning the, the importance of, of the plata the America's platform for uh, America's development platform um, and uh, how this has been the space where we developed um, the different positions and what I will now present is more thinking on which are the main elements of the work on, on energy transition, energy democracy, and, and like the, the main points that we want to, to focus on. And the first one uh, is, of course, the, the center of labor um, work in this case, I'm sorry, uh, the center of work uh, when we talk about any uh, political um, alternative politics. So for us, it is, it is key to acknowledge the importance of work uh, in the in the whole system in the production but also as a way of the realization of of the human being you know um, and how when we discuss about just transition or energy transition we need to focus and start from that point uh, and at this point and, and at, at this moment in particular with the pandemic but also before there are a lot of threats on understanding the importance of, of work and it's um, it's an attempt to try to diminish the importance and say work is not anymore and then the working class doesn't exist um, and now it's like going into flexibility 
flexibilizing and, and the precarity of the, of the work conditions. And we have a lot of examples on how it's happening that has been uh, implemented in Latin America for a long time. Um, and with, uh, unfortunately, with the, with the energy transition, uh, corporations are trying to push even further into these ways of uh, precarity and flexibilization and underman undermining the centrality of, of the work. So when, when we discuss about energy transition, uh, we also need to bring back uh, in the center the discussion about the quality, the type, the conditions of any job that is created uh, with the transition. So it's not only changing from one source to the other, uh, from fossil fuels to renewable energies, for example. It has a lot of things to add. And the, the central one for us is to put work in, in, in the main in the center of the discussion. Um, and yeah, of course, work and life, no? It's, we are not talking something as opposite to the other. And I think both Nassim and Natalia mentioned that when we defend work, we defend life and the conditions of life. Um, so for us, that will be the main, the main focus. Um, and we are seeing now with the pandemic how this is not in the center. Uh, actually is the opposite. Any proposal that comes, um, uh, or most of the proposals, not any, we, we need to acknowledge that, most of the proposals that come from, from, the, from the companies and from the governments are not putting that in the center, are thinking more on the economy and how to recover. And then it's supposed to, at the end, relate to life, at the end, relate to work. But for us, the, the change should be different and the starting point is completely different. And that's what brings dignity and decent jobs. Um, and when we talk about work, there are two things that we would like to add in this dialogue with other organizations. Um, that are, is first, the reproductive work. It's not only the productive, but also the reproductive work. And that is key when we talk about energy transition because Usually, many of the of the activities and work are uh, related to reproduction, and that has a, a, a an important link with the with the use of energy are assigned to women. So, talking about energy transition is also talking about feminism, um, and and also another point that that we add in this dialogue is is the work both from the cities and the rural areas and the countryside. So, it's not only urban workers who are discussing about energy transition. It's also persons and rural workers who come together into this, into this discussion. In that sense, as I said before, no, we understand energy transition as a class question. Um, and we, we think that uh, power relations and control determine uh, who, control, um, yeah, who controls the sources and the uses of energy, who controls the property, and how property, yes, as Lavinia mentioned, it's to be public, but also democratically controlled. Um, and we will add to that also the question on technology, how technology needs to be publicly and democratically controlled and discussed, and how knowledge needs to be understood from different regions. Natalia was saying before, uh, it's different to talk about energy transition uh, in the north than in the south. It's different to talk about technology and knowledge, and we need to, uh, um, to recognize the, the knowledge sources and the different wisdom both in North and South, and from that, build a, a social appropriation of the technology. Um, second point that I would like to go into is the, is the democratization of energy itself. Um, for us, uh, one of the like, historical dimensions of the, of, the, of the struggles in Latin America has been against privatization. Um, and this, this is linked to what was mentioned before by, by Lavinia, the importance of, of public uh, property, public control, and access to energy understood as a right, as a human right, and um, the, the property of the, the common property of the common goods, uh, of the commons when it comes to energy is, is central in our region. And that has been also something that has allowed to, to bring to the, together different struggles from different movements and regions. 
fighting against privatization and fighting for the democratic and public control. Um, and that's like uh, one of the main uh, historical traditions of the, of the worker struggles. And now it takes like a different stage, a different level. Um, when we talk about campaigns for energy democracy and when we bring that discussion into um, environmental justice and uh, public companies. Um, and in this discussion, we have been identifying like some principles that we would like to bring into the discussion about energy transition, which are, as I mentioned, democratization, the privatization, which could be linked to remunerationalization, decentralization, and deconcentration. That is how the energy system needs to change. We talk here about the system and how it needs to change and challenge the existing privatized, um, uh, com commodified um, system that works for the profit. Um, so in this context, um, the, the, one of the main um, discussions in the region is how to fight against the energy poverty. Um, so if we identify, acknowledge and guarantee the access to energy as a fundamental right, we are also tackling that question on, on energy poverty. Democracy is also linked to what you both mentioned before in terms of, of rights. Fighting for these things can cost people's life. Um, that's happening not only <coughs> in Colombia, unfortunately it is happening in Colombia, but not only in other countries in the region, it's happening and more and more with this confinement situation that we are in. So how we talk about democracy, access to energy, and bring both together and talk about peace as well. No, that's, that's part of, of the discussions. And I think it's, um, uh, we, we would like to, to, I would like to finish because Natalia will, will then come back, um, adding on, on the question on, on how to transform the system, the energy system, no? We, we need to go a little bit deeper into what we are talking about um, uh, of the transition, not only talking about sources, talking about transforming the system, involving different elements of, of this discussion, um, and of course, bringing the centrality of the social dialogue and the, and the fundamental uh, workers' rights. It's not uh, just to say some governments are, are fulfilling the requirements, are reducing the greenhouse gas emissions, or are presenting um, really uh, ambitious uh, targets. Uh, with the NDCs, for example, we have the, the case of Chile where they presented, they presented the, the, the NDCs, they were acknowledged as one of the best um, governments, but at the same time, we saw how the COP couldn't happen in Chile because of the human rights violations last year and how that continues today. On the 1st of May, people from Chile were put in prison, tortured, because they were protesting against the, the undemocratic measures. To, to present these NDCs, the Chilean government didn't uh, discuss with, with the unions, didn't take into account any organization to, see, to, to discuss which should be the country's proposal. So we cannot talk about energy transition on, or uh, just transition without bringing into the into the discussion the position from the unions from the organizations and from the the democratic discussion on rights um yeah so i will i will leave it here and natalia can add to finalize uh, okay i will do my best it's uh, it won't be as good as lida and please lida uh, you can jump in whenever you see i get stuck uh, to help me <laughs> Okay, well, um, I will uh, try to read some of the notes that, uh, that we had in, in Spanish, but into English. Uh, so, well, in, in, um, just to wrap up, in, in the Americas, um, the development models that have been um, promoted historically uh, are dominated by neo neoliberalism ideas. So um, the responses to the questions about uh, development and social justice are uh, very, um, um, Lida, 
eh, excluyentes, very um, uninclusive, very uninclusive, uh, uninclusive. Okay, uh, with uh, popular cl uh, classes, with working class people, uh, particularly uh, uh, working class people. So the discussion in Plada, in that programmatic uh, statement that that Tuca has developed, uh, is um, is uh, goes to the to the heart of of discussing the production and consumption model. Uh, before the, the pandemic, we were saying in our region that um, the that that we are suffering the, the 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 effects of climate change, and that and that that uh, suffering is um, uh, multiplies the inequality in 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 in, in the whole society. Um, and that and not only that, but also that uh, the um, deficit that we have in institutions and in mechanisms to protect a, a environment a, a, along with human rights are are very bad. Uh, so um, a, we it's very difficult to guarantee that we will have policies that attend uh, mitigation and uh, adaptation to climate change in this context. Um, we were discussing before the pandemic uh, how a uh, just transition, uh, how we need to uh, or orient, um, we need to put just transition, uh, uh, how we need to put, sorry, human rights along with just transition discussions. Um, especially uh, when talking about a violation of labor human, human rights. Uh, uh, about um, uh, uh, threats against democracy and the need to put uh, an end to uh, precarity. Um, in Brazil, uh, before the, the pandemic, uh, one of our trade unions that is affiliated to Tuca, CUT Brazil, that is very well known uh, worldwide, uh, was promoting and is still promoting a discussion about just transition among workers, especially from the electricity uh, sector and the uh, and the energy sector in in, in general. Um, they 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 were working and they are still working on trying to uh, get to uh, um, to know what uh, what is um, what what how is living a, a worker in the energy sector mm -hmm. and. What are the needs that they that they are? What are the the threats and the and the challenges that they are facing in uh, in the discussion about how uh, uh, energy is being transformating, so transformated uh, because of uh, the, the 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 need of governments to uh, attend climate change, and they uh, always said. Um, it, uh, even in the in the in the renewable sector, they are working in those sectors also, and they always said something that I think it's very um, illustrative about how uh, uh, about the reality that they are living. And they 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 always said, and Daniel Gallo is in is is participating and hearing us, and he's the um, uh, environment secretary of uh, CUT Brazil, and he always said that. Uh, uh, um, in uh, let me think how to say it in English. Uh, it will be the cleanest, the energy, the dirtiest, the job. That that will be yeah. So it's very difficult to think about the renewable sector and the need to have more renewable energy with this context. And we uh, we ask ourselves: Is this the Green New Deal for our region? Is this uh, reflecting what the Green New Deal will look like in our region, in our countries? Uh, now we are facing a context that, uh, never seen before. Uh, and um, even though this is very new for all of us in the world, uh, some of the debates that we were having um, in the COP in, in Madrid and uh, also before the COP and, 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 the, and the, in the other COPs and in other discussions are very um, uh, actual. And, and we, can, we can still say, uh, we, can, we can still recall some of those uh, uh, debates. Uh, um, 
um, the, in, in, in the trade unions, we always, when discussing environment, we always uh, uh, thought that we had um, uh, two opposite things, the environment in one side and labor in the other one, as, it, as if it were opposite. And, the, and we always said in discussing these issues in Tuca that they're not opposite, even though we sometimes uh, stand apart from environment uh, organizations or we look like standing apart. The experience in the region is that we try to work uh, with each other and try to uh, have collective common perspectives uh, about these issues. And, um, and, and in this context, with the pandemic, the, the opposite uh, issues that are being, um, that we are facing a, in a very dramatic way is, a, a, is about living, a, is about getting sick, because of the COVID-19 or starving. And that's a very, um, a, a very huge opposition. And people here, working class people here in all our countries are facing nowadays this opposition that we believe it's false, but they are facing it in, in, a, in a daily routine reality. They are, uh, asking themselves every day if they have to go to work, if they have to earn their income, or they they have to be they have they have to get sick. So that changes a lot about how we are uh, going to face uh, environmental crisis or environment or uh, uh, climate emergency. Because how, how um, well, I will I will go along. <laughs> Um, I, I, I would like to say also that in these alliances that we are building and they're, they're historic and they're, they, they are the, the, the ground uh, basis of how we think and we fight some of these challenges in the region uh, with uh, other um, social movements and social organizations. Since 2015, we have built what is called in Spanish Jornada Continental por la Democracia y contra el Neoliberalismo. It's like a political platform uh, in alliance with the peace and movement, the environmental movement, um, social organizations that are fighting against the debt, the public debt uh, of countries uh, and other uh, organizations. And that is a strategic uh, field in which we are fighting and putting these issues also in the environmental challenge, uh, the, the social justice challenge, the, social, the economic justice uh, challenge. Um, Lida, if you want to help, it's... Natalia, if you're right, yes. uh, we will. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, oh, okay. Lida and, and, and Natalia for, well, yeah, uh, have giving all this, um, this critical view of not only uh, the vital necessity to, to change the, the energy system uh, in Latin America, but the fact that it can only change if there is a, a global um, reaction to the way uh, energy is viewed and produced and extracted. And um, that's, I think, I, I would like to ask Lavinia after her, Having heard the, the, those just uh, testimonies and the, the, the importance that lead up at on the, the question of property and, and, and public ownership, uh, democratization of, of energy to actually have um, not a top down uh, only uh, process of, of, uh, of decarbonization, but a real uh, transformation uh, that would lead to. To, uh, to not only uh, decarbonization or, or, or transition, but a just transition where people are taking back rights on their, uh, on their, um, around the energy, uh, the, the, the production and the distribution of the energy. And um, yeah, I would like to ask you if you have um, examples of, of those um, um, citizen movements or, 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 or other uh, other examples in Europe where uh, communities have uh, have claimed and taken back their their, their energy. You've mentioned the, the Canis and Plymouth, but maybe you could also explain the, the different strategies 
uh, and the different alliances that uh, that are leading to those uh, to 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 claiming back energy. Uh, yes, thanks for for that question, and also uh, a lot to uh, Lida and Natalia. It was uh, interesting, very interesting to to hear um, the importance of of work and social reproduction and the many fundamental issues you raised. Um, in terms of um, going from a a top-down corporatized model that we now see uh, to a kind of bottom-up grassroots form forms. Um, yeah, there are different examples in the energy sector and beyond, um, but maybe um, I think it's very important to to raise some of the proposals that we have seen both from from. Spain, Catalonia, and also from the United Kingdom, where there have been uh, strong proposals to um, deprivatize and democratize, for example, the distribution grids in Spain, um, but also, for example, um, the uh, radical left um, by, led by uh, Jeremy Corbyn and how bringing back, bringing home energy was a report, for example, uh, that came out last year that really showed how um, there can be a very different energy model that is uh, differentiating between um, a national energy agency, regional ones, um, municipal ones, and community ones, right? And how these can complement each other, need to complement each other, so that um, you can have um, decision-making as close to home as possible, so that the decisions that are, are influenced by the people that are affected most by these decisions um, and then, for example, there is this uh, small uh, model, but I think very important from Wolf Hagen in Germany, um, where they have re-municipalized the grid, but they've done that together with a very strong public debate. Um, and that resulted in um, the citizens or the residents organizing into a cooperative to raise the kind of uh, money needed to pay for the wind turbine. Um, and as a result, they are also now on the board of this uh, local electricity company. Um, and the benefits are then much broader, right? So, so not only tariffs went down in terms of fighting energy poverty, but also uh, the number of staff uh, in the electricity company almost doubled. And also kindergartens were then subsidized. And it's, it's a small example, um, but I think it's important to show uh, the, the massive and numerous benefits that uh, can lead um, an energy transition, that, bring, that can bring an energy transition. Um, but also to say, I think we, we have only really started to grapple with these very complex questions because um, the exa example I just gave from Wolfhagen, you do see that there is an equation with um, citizens and having the finance to invest in the energy transition that then get a seat on the board of a company and that this is not um, the democratization we need. It just doesn't go far, far enough, right? Because energy, when we understand it as a human right and as a need, then um, just being a resident, not even a legal citizen, should be sufficient to give the input and to uh, influence the kind of policies that we need so that we're not left behind as residents um, uh, just because you, you are living in a certain place and because you need energy to survive. So I think... We need to really um, go much further than the current um, energy policies we now see in, in Europe, where this equation between citizen finance and citizen participation is, um, is reducing the, the democratic potential uh, that is needed. Thank you so much, Lavinia. Um, I've, thank you for, for those, those hits and those, those um, yeah, the, trusting those possibilities and I, I would like to to turn back to to Natalia and Lida um, around the question of you, you were mentioning the need of, of building strategies and within those strategies uh, the importance of, of work of work and protection of life and um, and you were mentioning the the the, the, the trade union uh, the trade union for energy democracy uh, um, initiative that is uh, putting at its core the, 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 the solidarity between workers pushing for, for a trust transition. Um, what do you think are um, 
the different possibilities of building a new strategy, new alliances, um, maybe also uh, seeing well with a COVID crisis uh, reaching out, uh, especially to uh, affecting workers and frontline communities first. Uh, of course, in the global south and in the global north as well, uh, is there? Do you see new movements and new alliances in the energy sector that could together push for a real uh, uh, transition? That's that's a question uh, to 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 you, Lida and Natalia, whoever wants to to start. Um, yeah, I think for for Tuka, it's been always important to to strengthen unity among the, the popular um, field, if we can call it, like the popular classes or people's classes, I think it's, it's the best way in, in English. Um, so yeah, unity as, as a strategy to fight the challenge that we are facing now and, and that we, we all were mentioning before, it's, it's key. And of course, like we, we talked from the regional perspective, the Americas perspective, and that includes a, a, a north and south dimension, and exchanging with other um, movement and organ movements and organizations is part of that work uh, with social movements. But in this sense, what what we have privileged in 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 the past years has been exactly this this alliance that Natalia was mentioning, the, the Jornada Continental, um, which is also built on the historical work and, and relationships. Um, so like creating new alliances and new strategies, I think it's it's something that, that needs to be built on 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 t in terms of the of the current situation and the platform. Um, but it's based on what we have been working until now. No, it's based on on the principles that we were presenting before, uh, and how this uh, can contribute to unity from actually the, these people's perspective, putting work and life in the center and facing the, the corporate attacks uh, and the human rights and labor rights violations. So from that, uh, we could discuss, uh, I think it's, it's key to think on, 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 the, on the unity also for, for unions, no? And that's been a process that Tuka has been uh, put in a lot of effort and energy in the past, and right now it's one of the main challenges. When when the work is questioned as a central aspect of life, uh, but at the same time, when this situation shows us how important work is and how dependent we are, we all are on on what is called the basic uh, jobs. That's when when we need to build more unity, and I think. Um, also bring in uh, all these dimensions of, of, of the work and the struggles into this new strategy. I don't know, Natalia, if you want to add something. No, just uh, um, one thing. It's uh, this discussion is also uh, facing trade unions to think about how um, what are the, the structures of trade unions and what type of trade unions we need in this context? In the past one, before the pandemic, but also and especially in this context. And that's a very difficult question because it's um, uh, reviewing what we are doing and how we are helping if we are uh, workers. Well, thank you very much. I, I would just like to ask because we have five minutes left and, and um, we were, um, we, were um, we were unfortunately missing one, one panelist, but um, in different uh, presentations, uh, you've been talking about the, the, the COP uh, and as a space uh, that is what it is, uh, often uh, captured by, by, by corporate power and uh, big, uh, big energy industries or, or big industries, uh, but also a place where movements are actually meeting, uh, building uh, strategies, links, uh, getting to know each other. Um, so do, do you think uh, there is this debate or is, is the COP a place that should be um, 
boycotted by 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 movements and and other uh, other groups, or should it be a, a place uh, used to actually uh, enter the to 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 make uh, claims and to 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 gain space and, and visibility as well? Um, knowing that the cup, the next cup will not uh, the, the cup that was. Uh, Planned uh, this year in Glasgow will not happen. Um, do you believe that uh, there is a need for a new for new spaces to be to be built by by movements and uh, organization towards uh, this question, like toward, for example, the, the 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 Green New Deal and a global Green New Deal? How do we who do we build that? Or do you think there is still um, that the COP is still a space that can be that can be beneficial for for from for different movements. Well, it's a very huge question, and I'm I'm afraid I can't um, answer it in in a very uh, d definitive way. Uh, but uh, what I, what I think that is most representative of trade unions' view in that sense is that uh, what I said in when the first uh, part of the of the of the intervention is that uh, Tuka always thought about the cops as a space um, that is um, I don't know how to say it in English. It's um, disputa. It's a space where we are struggling. Dispute. Where dispute. Uh, 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 dispute. This dispute space. I'm not sure if that's correct. So it's it, the attention. the The world is uh, putting the attention there, and the, the negotiations. It was uh, a very um, a good thing in Madrid to participate uh, um, facing what Chilean government is was saying in the COP, and in every opportunity we had, we we said it. And we said that it's not it's uh, it's not legitimate for the Chilean government to um, uh, being um, to preside presiding pres uh, being the presidency keeping uh, uh, the presidency of the COP when uh, it was withdrawn from from Santiago de Chile because of from Chile because of the 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 protests and uh, and uh, ultimately because the government couldn't face what uh, the social justice demands were coming from from people so uh, i think that our strength i will all, uh, say it again our strength inside the cop uh, will be uh, enough if we have uh, if we are strong and and if we are very noisy in the outside and that means getting together and in alliance with other social movements, and that also means uh, understanding that it's uh, they're they're not uh, there are very there are a lot of uh, false oppositions, uh, work environment, labor environment, but also this one in this context, um, uh, dying of hunger or dying of a disease. And we have to understand that environmental justice goes along with uh, labor justice, with social justice. And we can't claim that, for instance, we can't claim that Chilean government is a very good government because it's attending, is, uh, there's uh, NDCs, uh, uh, updating their NDCs and uh, giving a response, a governmental response to climate change. If they're re repressing people in the streets and if they're, if they're not calling uh, the... Uh, trade unions and workers to discuss what are the 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 actual policies that they are going to implement to face climate change. It, it, it's if if we are not in unity, we're we're very we are very lost and we are very alone. Thank you. Maybe quickly, Lida and, and, and Lavinia, just uh, some closing words around that. Um, I think I think what Natalia said is, um, yeah, she she collect. I I will just add, yeah, the struggle is is global. I agree, uh, but the differences in between regions are big. So how can we think on on this needed and urgent transition? Also understanding and taking into account those differences uh, and not deepening them. Uh, 
actually the opposite. How can we just push back into those inequalities, into those differences, into those uh, rights violations that happen in different regions? How can we push back instead of deepening them? That's the main question. And that applies in between regions and within the regions. Maybe just a small um, follow-up on that. Um, yeah, um, I guess the need to break open the debate, the formal debate of the COP and of uh, uh, the just transition mainstream that is far from just, far from a transition. Uh, so kind of to delegitimize those false solutions um, that have so many shapes and manifestations, but to bring the kind of, yeah, people develop uh, solutions to this um, space, to these spaces, and make as much noise indeed as possible. Um, maybe just, uh, yeah, some something that that uh, I I thought of while while uh, the others were were contributing. I feel the um, the way, of course, the cleaner the energy, the more dirty the the um, the power structures and and um, exploitation in a way. I guess also in terms of the whole um, reduction of um, a renewable transition, I, I think we also really need to see how um, renewables are sourced and really going into the, the bigger economy, um, the value chain, so to say, um, in terms of how we we can have community um, ownership over these resources and, and deciding prior with their consent about how uh, these, uh, these resources are used for whatever renewable technology in the, in the future. Um, and also how we relate to land, I think is a very big issue. So where to put these kind of so-called renewables um, and, um, and not to be extractive. So how do you relate to to um, land issues and the people that live on these lands and how they can really be um, the ones who own and control uh, and decide on how this is being developed and that their access to energy is first guaranteed. So um, yes, yeah, just thanks for, for, uh, for the other speakers and the organization of this space. Well, thank you very much. Um, and I think that we, we can try to, to conclude on, on this and I, I would like to, to reassess some, some very important points and I think that those are starting points uh, and, and uh, fun, fundamental questions that need to be taken when we are speaking about uh, the Green New Deal um, and, what it, and especially in the North when we have uh, all this discourse about uh, bringing renewables uh, and and it's done basically we 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 often hear uh uh the 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 image that if we just uh, switch the the alimentation from uh, from uh, dirty energy to renewables then we are we 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 are safe and we uh, and we succeeded and what what i what you've been altogether uh, very stressing is the I think the importance to to actually state that decarbonization uh, and 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 transition will not happen, actually will actually not happen if it doesn't put into its core uh, the question of of labor and the question of uh, of ownership and 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 democracy. So I think those three points are are central. And uh, as you also, Lida, actually stressed it out. Uh, a couple of times is the, the importance to recognize the difference uh, between the struggles, uh, the, the, the real life dangers that are uh, uh, facing everyday uh, activists in, in Latin America, in Africa, in Asia, in other places. Uh, so to recognize them and not to recognize them to, to better to put a wall or to say that we cannot reach out to the to the situation, but to actually try to 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 build on uh, on not only solidarities but concrete actions. Um, and I see the, the, a lot of responses in the chat and uh, and Samuel who has posted the 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 great uh, summary and work that has been done during the the counter summit of the COP in in uh, in uh, in Madrid. And I think those spaces are 
are there to um, to build those 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 uh, common strategies. Um, to I think we, what we were also uh, trying to 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 develop with uh, with today's webinar and, and and the series is to actually have a critical but constructive uh, position on the Green New Deal. We we I think all see the potential that a real uh, fully implemented uh, taking into uh, all voices into into its core uh, of a green new deal that can have but uh, but it needs to be it needs to be comprehensive and to 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 have those discussions before so um, again I would uh, thank very much a lot of people uh, for uh, making this uh, this webinar so interesting uh, critical uh, although the very complicated uh, technical situation that we that we've been facing. So thank you very much to our three panelists. I'm very um, I'm a bit sad that we didn't uh, uh, we couldn't access to the the Professor Ben Abdallah who couldn't uh, uh, make his presentation and present us the the, the question of, uh, of 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 Algeria. But uh, hopefully it will be a, a next time. So thank you very much to Natalia, Lida, and Lavinia. Thank you so much to the the great uh, the great interpreters who have done a very great job uh, in spite of the the, the complications. Uh, thank you, my colleagues Zitan and Hiron, who's been uh, who've been of a great help. Uh, that's uh, that's nice to have those uh, common uh, uh, com uh, common aid uh, mutual aid. I want to say and uh, thank you very much to all the attendees uh, for bearing with us, bearing with those uh, with those troubles and. Uh, we will come back uh, stronger and uh, with uh, with a better uh, inter interpretation installment. But again, thank you, Natalia and Lida, for having uh, accepted to switch to to, to English. Uh, we know it's it's totally not what we what we expected and what wanted to ask you. But thank you very much for for doing it and doing it greatly. And we will um, soon update you with uh, the coming episodes. So thank you very much for for being there, and we see. Uh, you all soon.